Evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining this webinar on post-op pain. My name is Angie Chan, and I'm the Project Manager for Surgical Improvement with the Specialist Services Committee and the BC Enhanced Recovery Collaborative. And on behalf of the SSC and the Collaborative and our co-sponsor, Pain BC, I'd like to welcome you to our webinar on post-op pain today. So thank you so much for joining us. Um, I just have a few administrative matters to mention before introducing our guest speaker. The first is that the webinar will be recorded and posted to our websites, and in the chat box, you'll see um, the website links there. Um, so if there's any, if any of your colleagues wanted to join us and couldn't, um, the uh, recording should be up by the end of this week. Um, if you could just mute your lines during the webinar, that'd be great. Sometimes we do get a lot of background noise. If you have any questions over the course of the um, uh, webinar, um, if you could throw your questions into the chat box, that would be great. And I'll be monitoring that, and then I can um, I can uh, just sort of alert Hans to your questions as we move along. And then at the end, we'll also have about 15 to 20 minutes for open discussion as well. So please uh, feel free to bring all of your questions at that point. So without further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce our guest speaker, Dr. Hans Clark. Hans is a staff anesthesiologist at the University Health Network in Toronto and the medical director of the Pain Research Unit at the Toronto General Hospital. After completing his medical degree and anesthesia subspecialty training, he went on to obtain his PhD in the Royal College Clinical Investigator Program at the Institute of Medical Science, University of Toronto. Uh, among his many research interests are evaluating the efficacy of preventive analgesia, identifying novel acute pain treatments following major surgery, identifying the factors involved in the transition of acute post-surgical pain to chronic pain, and identifying risk factors associated with continued opioid use and poor health-related quality of life after major surgery. So as you can see, he is a perfect speaker for our group today. Um, we're very excited to have him lead our webinar. Hans, I'll pass it over to you. Thanks very much, Angie. So it's a pleasure to be here. This is the second webinar we are presenting on this. And I was asked, given the enhanced recovery after surgery program and some of the novel um, uh, services we're implementing here in Toronto, that there might be a nice fit uh, to comment uh, on not only strategies that can help uh, with implementation within the ERAS protocol, but also um, to to guide maybe some new services uh, as, as they come forward. So uh, without further ado, I don't have any disclosures uh, at this point in time, no conflict of interest. Everything I say will be uh, my own thoughts and based on uh, the, the literature to date. I'd like to start with this slide because I think it really fits nicely where we sit when we talk about enhanced recovery after surgery. There's clearly a path to get a patient from A to B, and we're very concerned with targets, uh, length of stay targets and how fast we can move people. But, you know, if you're here listening to this webinar and uh, you're like myself, you're clearly interested in that journey for the patient. And I think it's incumbent on folks uh, such as us to really understand that, that that's an important part of uh, any ERAS protocol is, is uh, how patients actually feel along the journey from A to B as they uh, walk in the hospital until they leave. So uh, I, I was, uh, you know, confronted by this uh, uh, quote that I saw from the New England Journal of Medicine about 30 years ago, and, and uh, Walco said that pain can be relieved effectively in about 90% of our patients, but often we don't effectively relieve them, that in about 80% of patients. And I think we've moved quite some distance away from that. I think we still have a ways to go, but uh, we're definitely doing better than uh, not helping 80% of our patients. And so, you know, with that little bit of uh, intro, uh, we're going to be talking a little bit about the predictors of increased post-op pain, what the literature kind of says to date. I'll talk about chronic post-surgical pain. And this is kind of new stuff that I've started to talk about in terms of actually actualizing the cost. And I'll give you some of the costs and I'll pick on my own institution per se. And we'll then move into the state of perioperative opioid use. And there really is an opportunity to marry both of these concepts together and address a significant public health issue, which is one of the things that I'm sure the stakeholders, in particular our government agencies, et cetera, are, are more interested in than the pain per se. We'll talk about some of those strategies that with some evidence behind, in particular, we'll focus on the colorectal type populations because I know that is the focus of your ERAS program uh, in BC. And I'll, I'll share you um, uh, some insight into some of the new initiatives that we're uh, embarking upon at the Toronto General Hospital. 
So if we look at um, the mechanisms related to surgery, we know that the, you know, a patient's perception of surgery is what they feed back to us, but it involves several neuronal inputs. And anytime there is a nociceptive input or a peripheral sensory uh, neuron that senses either, a, in, in this particular instance, you know, a cold or heat sensitivity, once you take that away, that uh, input tem tends to resolve. In terms of post-surgery, when we talk about the inflammatory input, we all know that that uh, has its peak maybe around 48 to 72 hours, and then that uh, waxes and wanes by about week seven. But clearly, the neuropathic input is one of the things that if we highlight in the acute post-op setting, those patients that go on to have increased neuropathic pain and at discharge have increased neuropathic pain are set up to have a tougher post-surgical journey. And so putting um, programs in place that are identifying some of these subsets of patients will be important in terms of what we're going to talk about uh, moving forward. When we look at... Um, Sorry, move the slide forward here. When we look at the concept of how, you know, a patient goes from an acute pain potentially to develop a chronic pain, it would be really nice if the model that we put forth on, on in that B panel made a lot of sense. So by simply blocking the afferent inputs uh, to the brain, both preoperatively, intraoperatively, and postoperatively, somebody could be rendered pain-free long-term. Well, we know it's not so idealistic. Clearly, there's a big supertentorial driver. There are lots of other... Um, uh, uh, potential reasons why patients go on to, to uh, yeah. develop pain long-term other than simply blunting it from a pharmacologic standpoint. That being said, there are three main areas in which uh, have been studied you know, for the past 20 years in terms of things that predict acute post-op pain. And we first start with specific patient demographic factors. And the most common ones tend to be, for whatever reason, females have a higher predisposition than males. The younger you are, you're at higher risk for developing a pain problem long term. And there's been some recent associations with potentially uh, increase in terms of your BMI. When we look at potential surgical factors, uh, we can talk about uh, clearly surgeries that have high nociceptive drivers. So potentially, uh, thoracic operations, abdominal operations, uh, in particular hips and knees, the orthopedic populations, and you can see that as that no pronociceptive drive wanes, then uh, the the tendency to develop um, long term pain also does. Typically, open versus laparoscopic. That concept has been um, uh, there for some time. We'll talk about uh, some data. I'll present some data that may perhaps uh, argue with that concept. Uh, the duration of surgery, number of chest tubes being placed uh, after specific surgeries in uh, inpatients versus outpatients, and that may clearly be due to the more extensive nature of inpatient surgery versus outpatient surgery. And clearly, the psychosocial uh, drivers, we know that patients with increased anxiety, depression, those that ruminate uh, about their pain, uh, folks that uh, have score high on a neuroticism scale, and clearly the more optimistic people, that's actually a protective factor with respect to developing uh, pain postoperatively. So this is one of my favorite slides because it encapsulates the pain phenotype. It's, it's how I like to look at it. And uh, we have a pretty large genetics program that's running in the background of some of our perioperative work. We have uh, REV approval to collect about 10,000 samples, actually. We're at about 3,500. And I think the time has come that, you know, we shouldn't be expending a ton of energy into looking at these risk factors and supposedly, you know, identifying new risk factors. We, we have a clear picture based on the last 20, 30 years in terms of things that affect and lead to the potentiation of pain both, to, both acutely and more so now we're starting to focus on the, on the chronic pain aspect. And so, you know, as I said, your specific demographics, the fact that you have a history of anxiety or depression, your, whether or not you ruminate over your pain, we know that your environment clearly feeds back as well to your perception of the pain. And we as physicians and allied healthcare workers, the, the, the efficiency at which we can help control pain will also feed back on your quality of life and affect that pain phenotype that people will uh, give you as, as, as they relate back to their pain. So I'm going to move into probably one of the, the better systematic reviews out there with respect to the incidence of neuropathic pain post-surgery. And this was work done by a Danish group. And what they did was they looked at uh, about 281 studies that assessed post, uh, persistent post-surgical pain in 11 different surgical subtypes. The prevalence of neuropathic pain uh, was used uh, uh, with the neuropathic pain grading system. 
within these studies. And what they found were there were two main uh, groups. And that, the, the two populations that jumped out at them were the thoracic surgery populations and the breast surgery population. So anywhere between a 60 to 68 percent was the report in the literature with respect to persistent post-surgical pain. And a pretty high incidence after groin or hernia repair of about 30 percent. What's interesting, and I think what I find uh, very important is that the hips and knees, although we talk a lot about persistent pain after orthopedic surgery, they're probably not the best model to be studying this acute to chronic conversion because the fact remains that most of these people have their operation uh, for pain. And we really have done a poor job in most of the literature to date in terms of documenting what that uh, preoperative pain state was. And then we use a uh, an, an instance number long term without a good comparison. And so I think when we start to do that, you're going to see that actually hips and knees are being done because they're efficacious. People typically do better rather than worse after those operations. And so, you know, you, uh, we, we often see slides and uh, such as the one in front of you here. Well, when we talk about this instance of chronic pain post-surgery, and these numbers are horrific in that in that middle column, it tells us absolutely nothing. So 5% to 70%, anywhere from 30 to 90%, and even we look at inguinal hernia, you're looking at 5 to 70%. What can we really make of these numbers? And, and, and I often say put that aside. What we do know is that the estimated instance of severe chronic pain is about 5%, 5 to 10% at most, and probably across most surgeries. And so, you know, when you when you frame it at a five to ten percent level, people automatically want to minimize and say, well, what's the big deal? And so, I'm going to present to you uh, some inf some information that might be surprising or might not be. Once I can move my slide ahead here, and I like this slide because it's ten years ago now. We're we're in 2000. Well, it's 11 now. We're in 2016, but at that time there were 26.6 million surgical procedures being done in the U.S. And yet, let's use a five percent conservative number in terms of people that went on to have disability from their surgery, not just a pain number. A pain number means nothing. A 7, a 6, a 5, a 4, or a 2 are really meaningless. What's more important is how disabled are these people? Are they able to go back to work? And what's actually happening? And let's take that 5% rate, and let's say it's 1.3 million surgical operations. Multiply that by 10, we're at 13 million in 2015. And if you use 10%, we're at 26 million uh, people over the past year. And and, and, and take, a, take a look at the number of surgeries being done worldwide. That's 200 million surgeries a year. So this is not a small phenomenon. But that being said, this is all pie-in-the-sky numbers. And what we needed to do when we were applying for funding and building programs was to say, okay, what is a true dollar value? And not only that, what's a true dollar value in Canadian healthcare system? So I have American data for you. That's the top panel there. So, you know, the, probably one of the better studies today was a study by Parsons in 2013. And what he demonstrated was that persistent post-op pain can incur probably direct costs. Again, these are U.S. numbers of about 13,000 a year, and direct, indirect costs of about 30. So that's $43,000 in U.S. Uh, dollars per patient per year if you end up in that 5%. So we decided to take Canadian numbers. So we know that if we took the 10 priority surgeries performed in Canada, that is about 445,000 Canadians have a top 10 priority surgery on an annual basis. If we use that conservative 5% number and we put a dollar value to that with respect to what it's costing our Canadian healthcare system, that's $900 million. Make that 10%, you're at $1.8 billion. Now, I like to pick on my own institution, as I said, because acute post-op pain, for example, that progresses to chronic pain in a 30-year individual is as much of a hit of a million dollars over the course of their lifetime. So we like to do liver transplants and lung transplants. And sometimes you know, we have a live donor population where we take an individual and they, they are prepared as best as possible. But if that person isn't prepared for not even their severe pain, but their three or four out of 10 pain, and they can't get back to work or return to what they were doing, that's the cost that that will ensue over, the, over their lifetime to our healthcare system. And so to drive this home even more, and I think this is an important slide because it really encapsulates what you can sell to your stakeholders at your institution. And I'm going to say that, you know, using the Toronto General cost model, we do 6,000 major surgical interventions a year. Of those, four, sorry, 6,000 surgical interventions, of those, 4,000 are major surgical interventions. And let's use that conservative 5% number. If we use that 5% number and we develop 200 new cases of chronic post-surgical pain from that intervention, we then half the number because I'm saying that probably our Canadian estimate is half of the U.S. estimate. 
and that's probably conservative, and we say we increase by about 7,000, that incremental cost to the system. Now, the more important number I want you to look at is on the left side, not more important, but as important. We have an electronic medical record system, and our number in terms of patients that walk in the hospital already with a chronic pain condition or already on an opioid-based medication is about 12.5%. And I would argue that regardless of the hospital across the country, if you look at your numbers when you come through and you have, you to have a way to track, it's going to fall somewhere between 10 and 15%. We know from a perioperative standpoint, from an anesthesia standpoint, that we do a horrific job at walk, of someone walking into the hospital with X number of milligrams of an opioid and walking out uh, probably at around two or three times more of that. And I'll show you some data uh, later on to, to speak to that as well. Actually, I may not be showing you that in, in this talk, but that's the number, about three times the amount of opioid-based medication is, on average, what people are, are increased. And then they start down the spiral of uh, figuring out where this comes from. And let's give that a 5,000 annual cost. You'll notice a discrepancy there. If we were looking at an increase and we're using 5% of 400, that number should be about 400 patients. So we're saying 60%. And the cost from our institution alone, our hospital, is anywhere from 3 million to 4.1 million annually in terms of incremental costs from the development of pain disability following surgery. Now, for those of you that know the numbers, you won't be surprised to know that $600 billion are spent annually in the U.S. on chronic pain. The number that we use in Canada is $60 billion. And you can see that if this is from one institution, and the numbers I presented two slides before, we're looking at approximately, I would say, anywhere from 4 to $6 billion a year. Do the numbers? Pain and chronic pain in Canada costs more than HIV, cancer, and um, uh, HIV, cancer, and heart disease in, in our country as we speak. Now, let's move it forward because I think what happens here is that stakeholders don't buy into the pain aspect. Unless you treat pain, unless you treat perioperative patients, and you have, uh, you have your ERAS patients that you see the specific patients that will have a problem, then you start to realize the problem. And remember that these types of patients are not 85% of the patients that you'll see. It is a small 15% of your population that will go on to consume 90% of your pain resources. Now, given that the pain piece is important to us, what is important from a public health standpoint is the opioid uh, problem that we have. And I think, if I'm not mistaken, BC just jumped Ontario uh, last month with the highest rate now of prescription opioid deaths in uh, the world. Ontario had that, uh, had that, uh, uh, that auspicious um, uh, distinction of being the highest opioid uh, prescription mortality rate uh, in the world, but BC has now jumped us, if I'm not mistaken. And so, you know, this I, I thought was an opportunity whereby which we could combine a public health problem with a long-term pain problem, which is why we developed a lot of what we did uh, in Toronto. And so I think many of you have seen these types of ads in BC. These are, you know, Globe and Mail ads, solving the pain pill killer crisis it's in the hands of the doctors. Doctors groups are, agree painkillers are prescribed. The bottom left is from morphine to hillbilly heroin. And one of my favorites are the next one, which is, you know, the new drug crisis, addiction by prescription. And then you have groups in particular uh, here in Toronto and in Ontario that are attacking perioperatively and saying that, you know, if you prescribe an opioid or an NSAID uh, within seven days of anybody's operation, that patient or that population has a 10% risk of being on a persistent opioid approximately a year after their operation. This just came out, uh, I guess, two or three months, three months ago now. And, you know, we're probably about three to four years behind uh, the U.S. And Obama has just put billions of dollars, both of public and private sector monies combined, to address in their country prescription drug opioid abuse and the heroin use. Unfortunately, our prescription drug abuse is much more problematic because we, it is much more accessible in Canada than, than it is in the U.S., and the heroin use is a significant issue in the U.S. So let's look at that study that I just pointed out uh, two slides ago. So after low-risk surgery, there was a study that said, you know, if you have your cataract or your lap coli, you have a 10% risk of being on a persistent opioid a year after. And these are opioid-naive individuals that walk into the hospital. And so we thought that was a pretty high number. And using the exact same ISIS database, we set out to determine whether or not that 10% made a lot of sense. I'm going to pause before I show you that data because I want to address the CADAMS data. And I think those of you who are not aware of what the CADAMS 
uh, database is, it is basically a database of uh, uh, telephone interviews across the, the about 20,000 respondents that represent our Canadian population. And you can see that as physicians, yes, we have a problem, but we've actually started to curtail our prescription opioid use. And the prescription and the use of the, the patients that are using the opioids to get high has pretty much remained the same. So we have a problem. We need to come up with solutions to address it. And uh, uh, we'll, we'll get into some of those solutions later on. So does this same phenomenon of a 10% risk of being on a persistent opioid still uh, exist after major surgery. And major surgery is important because everybody has an IVPCA or a PCEA and they have been exposed to an opioid at some course throughout their hospital stay. And that most patients are also being sent home with an opioid. And so, you know, our answer was quite different. It was a 3.1% prolonged opioid use rate at uh, the second uh, trimester. So you, you had to have filled the prescription in the first or second trimester. And what does what does that tell us? Well, it, tell, it tells us a couple of things. First of all, we can be pretty certain that 97% of the patients, and again, this is an opioid naive population, that 97% of the patients that walk in our hospital not being on an opioid that get exposed to an opioid will no longer continue or persist on their opioid based medication. However, 3.1% is the individual patient risk. And although you know those authors of the previous paper would like to say that this is likely addiction, there are clearly other issues at play here. And one of the things we talked about early on in the talk was the risk based on the type of nociceptive surgery. And unfortunately, if you have a thoracic operation, you are at higher risk. Your odds ratio is almost doubled for developing or persisting on your opioid beyond that first trimester. Let's look at the MI. So the minimally invasive is your laparoscopic. And so we, ha we hang our hats on the fact that, oh, laparoscopic surgery is so much more superior from a pain standpoint. But the fact is we've probably, those of you that are, that are in the perioperative environment, you see when those, those nerves are being hinged on with trocars just as much as if they were being sutured and wrapped around with uh, sutures. So we still have a lot of uh, questions to ask with respect to the laparoscopic versus the open issue. So to round up kind of some of the data that we put forth and published in the BMA, a BM, uh, British Medical Journal story, younger age, lower income, specific comorbidities, and renal failure is an interesting one because, you know, if, if you have renal failure, you're never going to be prescribed an NSAID or any other type of pain medication per se. You come in perioperatively, perhaps you're given a script to walk out the door, and you can see why this would be perceived by a patient as being beneficial. Clearly, we saw, again, if you come in on a benzo or you come in on an SSRI, you're at higher risk for uh, persisting on your opioid-based medication. And we touched on already the thoracic surgery uh, procedures as being higher risk. So interestingly, we now know, again, just to recap, gender, age, anxiety, these things predict your ability to, uh, your, your tendency to develop pain. But we also know that no other patient factor has been consistently related, we can't say causal, to development of a uh, pain problem as pain itself. And so, you know, why does pain actually predict pain? And there's, there's tons of theories as to why this may be true. You know, after an injury, you may have what's left of your intact or your nociceptive A-delta afferents that are trying to re -innervate. And for some reason, they go awry. And once they're injured, they sprout and they continue to have this ectopic focus that, that starts to deliver an abnormal signal to the brain. We know that, you know, central sensitization has been around for decades now in terms of multiple hits. Your, your, your possible genetics predisposing you to the potential for developing pain. And ultimately, uh, we know now that clearly we have psychosocial drivers as well as social and environmental drivers with respect to this. And so, you know, I'm going to pause and say there's two distinct populations that we're talking about when we're dealing with your ERAS type patients. You clearly have your patient that comes in who does not have chronic pain, who isn't on an opioid, and that's probably the majority of your patients that you're seeing, and unless they come from an IBD population, which unfortunately are, are the way we care for IBD is, is fraught with problems and that needs to be corrected as we move forward uh, from a pain standpoint. And again, you have your 15 or your 12.5% of your chronic pain patients that persist on opioids. So, you know, in, in about 1988, uh, Patrick D. Wall uh, came up with this concept of preemptive analgesia. I think we've moved well beyond this, but it was simply they administered local anesthetic and opioids prior to surgery to hopefully block or suppress the sensitizing effects of the afferent injury barrage. And clearly, we know now it takes more than just this simple preemptive approach. Instead, what we what we've termed now, and this has been 
clearly documented is we want to address this from a preventive uh, standpoint. And what that means is typically anything you do, any intervention from a pharmacological standpoint, if you look at how that changes uh, a patient's outcomes well beyond that, you know, five half-lives of that drug will potentially be something that you've modified or changed and could be termed a preventive effect. And so, you know, what we aim to do is do this not just in the post-op or the pre-op setting, but clearly throughout the, uh, the, the journey of the patient as they flow through the hospital. Moving into the kind of multimodal concept, uh, I think we, many of you on this webinar will be very aware that all this simply means is we're going to address a different class of analgesic agents that act at different sites in order to reduce the central sensitization and hopefully obtain better pain control for our patients. When we look at, uh, you know, the modern concept of, of reducing pain and reducing the consumption of your analgesics by adding different agents, we come to see that what we hope to see, sorry, is a reduction in adverse effects. And one of the things we saw for sure when we started to add these uh, multimodal pathways was a reduction in our opioid-related uh, adverse events, which is clearly beneficial to our patients. And so, you know, as perioperative physicians and healthcare practitioners, you have all of these agents in your armamentarium. And I'm sure that most of you probably utilize the top four, which are typically your NSAIDs, your acetaminophen, your anticonvulsants, but rest assured there are many others that you can add and include into your perioperative paradigm and tailor to whatever patients you see as they come through the door. And I'll just touch on some of the evidence uh, very quickly with uh, the ones you know, and maybe a little bit more detail about some of the ones that uh, you uh, will uh, not know as well. And so, you know, I, I like this diagram because it really get, shows you starting from the periphery and heading to the brain where some of these medications may act. And simple things like your steroid-based medications can have an effect locally. Your anti-inflammatories and the COX-2s in particular uh, can have also a peripheral effect uh, in the in the tissues. Clearly, your local anesthetics have an effect blocking and blunting those sodium channels into the uh, central nervous system. Once you hit the central nervous system, we believe that this is where, you know, your anticonvulsants have a significant effect in the dorsal horn. Again, you'll see the return of your NSAIDs and your opioid-based medications along with your local anesthetics. All of them in the neuraxial space uh, can have not only blunting in the dorsal horn, we know that clearly using our epidurals can stop the transmission uh, to the, to the, to, to the uh, uh, CNS. I should say blunt the transmission, not stop it altogether. And we know that your acetaminophen, in particular, from a pain standpoint, it's unfortunate. This medication is an antipyretic. It really is not a pain medication. And unfortunately, we see it being used as a primary pain medication these days because it does have some mild effects from a pain standpoint. What's uh, for sure uh, uh, an issue that has totally been underreported is our anticonvulsants do have a CNS effect and uh, have a, a, a CNS depressant effect. And that's why somnolence and sedation is a big uh, part and parcel of the side effects you see with gabapentin. And I think, you know, one of the bigger additions to the pain uh, armamentarium has been the addition of our SNRIs. And for 30 to 40, actually for 100 years, it's always been the periphery to the CNS. And we've lost sight of what that uh, pathway from the brain down does. And clearly, there are two pathophysiological processes at play, one that drives the signal to the brain and the other one that drives the signal down. And our SNRIs can actually increase and potentiate that descending neuroinhibitory cognitive pathway that has really become highlighted in, in recent years. So one quick slide on your coccids, and in particular the coccids, because I am still a big fan, and I know there is huge uh, debate with the NSAIDs and the um, use in ERAS protocol, and, I, and I'll... And I'll highlight in particular, I'm a cardiac anesthesiologist as well, and, you know, 10, 15 years ago, we banned a protonin from the market due to similar retrospective data links to uh, increased cardiovascular deaths, and it turned out the data was actually incorrect. And so, you know, to have practice change based on, again, retrospective data for people who end up with anastomotic leaks, which potentially would have been treated because they were sitting and dwindling on the wards for days, is a sad state. But that is where we are, and that is often the fight that we're fighting in terms of whether or not coccids are or should be used in uh, the ERAS protocols. I still argue that we should, but unfortunately, it's been taken off of our ERAS protocols here in Ontario as well.
clearly the anticonvulsants have made it onto the radar. Uh, you know, for those of you that are familiar with these medications, they were brought to market as anticonvulsants and were found to be terrible anticonvulsants in the uh, late 80s. They were brought into the marketplace as a chronic pain medication. I'll, I have a couple slides to show you uh, what those uh, results look like. And more recently, pregabalin is the uh, is the big brother of uh, gabapentin, and the reason it's more uh, reliable is they've substituted an amino acid group to uh, enable more reliable absorption. So, you know, these drugs are uh, absorbed via the small intestine. There's very minimal interactions, and the one caveat you have to be aware of are patients with renal failure. So, you know, the, those who run into problems perioperatively in particular, when they give big doses, if they don't take a look at what that creatinine is, or their GFR in particular, which is probably more important, will run into the issues with these drugs. Where do they bind? They bind to those alpha-2 delta subunits. And what do they actually do? Well, what they do is they quiesce the, the neuron that's on speed and calm those nerves down. And I have a schematic of that, I think, uh, in the next slide. So one of the initial studies in the late 90s was uh, this study that looked at gabapentin in diabetic painful neuropathy and they found at eight weeks of treatment, there was about a 30% decrease in, in terms of pain scores. And uh, Gilron at Queens replicated this. But on top of replicating this, this small finding, he really introduced the concept of multimodal analgesia perioperatively and demonstrated that as you increased your adjuncts, both a, a, an anticonvulsant and an NSAID, you were able to decrease uh, pain uh, almost synergistically as you added these other medications. And so, you know, what are these types of characteristics that your patients are complaining of? And if a patient is walking out that door or on day two or three, they're still describing the stabbing, shooting, burning, numb pins and needles or tingling, any of these neuropathic drivers, be rest, rest assured that these patients need to be followed a little bit more closely. And if they still have these same findings a week from now, there's a good likelihood that they will continue to have these findings long-term. There was a fantastic um, uh, study in 2003 by Chris Hayes uh, in acute pain at the time. The journal's uh, no longer with us. But, you know, what he did was he took a, a, a survey of all of the patients that went through his acute pain um, service at his hospital, and he found that the 5 to 7% of patients that he identified with these acute neuropathic pain drivers early on, 60% of those patients had uh, an issue with chronic persistent pain at uh, six months. So keep that in mind. We have an opportunity to identify these patients early and then hopefully, based on some of the things we can do, modify their trajectory long term. And so this is that schematic of the, the gabapentin molecule that potentially binds to the alpha-2 delta subunit there on the right side and quiesces the neuron. So we kind of have a schematic as to how that may work. Some of you may recognize this plant. It's where we get our, uh, our lidocaine, and I'm going to highlight lidocaine because I know it's one of the medications that, you know, has made it to the ERAS protocol. And, you know, there's been lots of studies prior, moving it, prior to moving it into the abdo population. We know that it improves dynamic pain. It decreases your opioid use. It's just simple infiltration, and uh, some people use it intraperitoneally. You have to be a little more careful when you use it intraperitoneally because clearly there's a, a significant absorption that occurs. Um, in the peritoneal uh, membranes. Clearly, if you're looking at orthopedic literatures, it's the, it's the mainstay for peripheral nerve blocks. And, you know, now we move into what our pathway was supposed to look like in Ontario with your celecoxib and your gabapentin. We can talk more about the doses that were chosen. There really weren't uh, much in the way of rhyme or reason in terms of some of that dosing. Now, when we talk about where lidocaine falls in, clearly, I think... Uh, uh, it's in your protocol as well that if a patient can uh, is appropriate for an epidural, then a thoracic epidural makes sense. However, if they're not, then they end up on a potential IV lidocaine, which is started pre-incision, and uh, depending on your institution, stops at the end of surgery or potentially continues on. We're now in the process of uh, having this added uh, outside of our ICUs, but on our step-down wards, in particular on our on our general surgery wards, because it's something we want to continue postoperatively. And so there was a pretty reasonable um, uh, systematic review looking at lidocaine, inter uh, uh, lidocaine infusions intraoperatively in particular uh, with colorectal surgery uh, versus uh, TEA. And the next slide will show you the results of that meta-analysis. And so they identified 29 trials, and you can see some pretty impressive results there. Uh, reduction in pain at rest, pain with cough, 
uh, a potential small effect in terms of hospital stay. We'll see if all of these things kind of bear out over time. But what I found interesting was that, you know, over half of these studies had toxic plasma levels. So one of two things, either we're quite conservative with what our toxic plasma levels are, or that there may have been an underreporting of uh, side effects. There's no doubt you see the, an overall CNS blunting uh, when a patient wakes up having had an IV uh, lidocaine infusion run for a significant amount of time in the PACU. One of the better Cochrane reviews looking at local anesthetic was done by a husband and wife combo out of New York. And what they did was they looked at all uh, uses of local anesthetics, uh, both in regional anesthesia plus uh, IV infusion and peripheral nerve uh, uh, uses. And they looked at over 4,000 studies, uh, 23 eventually made it to the uh, ultimate meta-analysis. And that's because really and truly this concept of looking well beyond your surgical time frame has only been around for the past, you know, three to five, maybe five to five years or so. And so you're really now starting to see studies that have to follow patients to a year uh, start to come uh, come to the literature. And so, you know, in terms of the patient populations they looked at, they looked at thoracotomies, amputations, breast surgery, laparotomies, you name it. And they looked at all types of uh, anesthetic uh, uh, techniques which were used, epidurals, paravertebral, and uh, grouped a lot of the other interventions in terms of topical versus nerve blocks versus IV infusions, et cetera. And, you know, they identified two main groups that showed a significant effect. And again, this is an effect looking at a pain reduction long term, which is approximately two to three months after the operation. In this study, it was three months. And uh, sure enough, there was a, a number needed to treat of a benefit of every fourth patient following thoracotomy with an epidural. Uh, uh, analgesic technique, and after breast surgery, it's the paravertebral blocks, which I think there's been significant PR around. The one caveat, clearly these are all small studies, and I think the work's now being done to follow them prospectively on a larger basis, because we know that systematic reviews, uh, although they're, they're great, they have their own shortcomings. There was a huge Cochrane review done by uh, Ian Gilron out of Queen's with uh, some of his students and combined with uh, some of the guys out of uh, Britain as well. And they tried to pool all of the, look at all of the pharmacotherapy uh, interventions and with respect to who and to, to which agents reduced uh, chronic pain long term. And you can see that the one that clearly wins is uh, ketamine and stands the test of time. An underutilized drug uh, that uh, is fraught with you know, historical uh, data for with hallucinations and bringing back PTSD type symptoms. But uh, if you do use it perioperatively, and, and the, the number in terms of the dose needed to treat, when you look at all of these different regimens that are run, typically comes in around the 30 to 40 milligram mark. So not a massive dose. That being said, there are various infusions that uh, people recommend. And this is something we are actually also trying to implement on our step down wards in particular post uh, thoracotomy as, as we move forward. There, if we, if we talk about this uh, Cochrane review in particular, they made a bit of a mistake with the anticonvulsants. If you look back uh, closely, there's a bigger signal than they reported uh, in, that, in that Cochrane review, but uh, we won't get into that in this talk. So, you know, beyond this acute pain um, uh, practice, well, what's next? What are we hoping? Well, what we hope is that clearly based on what we do, we can, we can have effective acute pain treatments. But, you know, does the effect last beyond patient comfort? Does it offer better control? Are we, therefore, uh, enhancing and enabling our patients to rehabilitate? And what is the long-term benefit? And ultimately, can we affect this development of chronic pain? And so, you know, we were quite lucky to have a ministry-funded program about a year and a half ago, and, a, and I'm waiting with bated breath since our, our government changed over, changed over, but we're, we're hopeful that we'll get a long-term platform to continue some of this work. And so based on all the things you've just heard, all of the, the different techniques, uh, adding the cost of chronic pain uh, post-operatively, uh, in addition to addressing our public health crisis, we propose the mechanism whereby which we can monitor this trajectory, hopefully modify it as well by improving their pain. And that we don't have the answer yet. We're still um, not looking at some of our data right now and provide this regular monitoring and safe weaning of the opioids to help with the public health aspect. And clearly we built this team and our goal was to one, help the patient, two, facilitate safe discharge and develop a mechanism to help these patients as they transition from the community with the goal of all of the things we just talked about with respect to rehab and getting them back to 
whatever functioning they were at prior to uh, their interaction with us in the hospital. We were lucky enough to get some good press. We have, we've had a, a couple of nice uh, pieces in different media outlets. So who is part of this transitional pain service or this team that we put together? And you don't need a huge group. It looks like a big group here, but really you need a nurse practitioner. You need physicians that are interested. You do need someone to coordinate your patients between the surgical services and your follow-up clinics. We have added a big psychology component as well as an acupuncture component, as well as you need an admin assistant to liaise with your patients long-term. That's kind of a, a group shot of what we look like and some of the patients that have come through our um, uh, service has given us some uh, impressive testimonials. I can give you some case-by-case -case patient accounts of, of some of the successes. It hasn't always been successes. We have had a couple of failures and a couple of uh, unfortunate instances, but we learn from them and, and move forward. So we have a big psychological uh, aspect of the program. Clearly, we know that there is this dirty pain and clean pain concept. Just to elaborate a, a touch on that, you know, that clean pain is clearly you've had an operation, you now have pain, and that pain serves a physiologic purpose. The dirty pain, which is where a lot of people really have a problem in terms of functioning is, oh my God, this pain is never going to end. It's never going to go away. I can't go back and take care of my kids. I can't deal with my family. I'll never be able to make dinner again and really teasing that out. And so this this is not hidden behind any any uh, firewall. You can Google this. You can find this. And you can see some of the techniques that we're using among others with respect to uh, dealing with patients as they move forward. We were lucky enough to be given uh, a uh, round of funding to develop uh, an app. It's not out there yet. It is, uh, there is a chronic pain app that this group has put forward, but we're modifying it. We should have it hopefully in the hands of our patients uh, by the spring. Uh, and the goal there is to, you know, have that patient not have to recall every, every time they come to the hospital the last two weeks of their experience and us be able to have real-time feedback with that patient that's sitting in their kitchen or in their living room that's tracking their pain and something's gone awry we then can bring them back in and not wait three weeks and have that uh, spiral continue out of control. So, you know, some of the take-homes I'll, I'll leave you with in the last couple of slides here with respect to the strategies for ERAS is, you know, again, it's not 85% of your patient. It's a patient that are going to struggle long-term. It's going to be about that 15% uh, of patients, uh, one, that have a pre-op chronic pain issue or come in on an opioid-based medication, and that subset of your non-opioid patient population that have high risk uh, predisposing factors that we've talked about. And what you wanna do for those patients, and in particular, your chronic pain patients, is implement as aggressively some of those strategies we've talked about in uh, the webinar to, the, to this point. When we look at the general population, and so you know, you're taking all comers, I think the best place to start and what we've done strategically is, is engage significantly with the primary care in and around your institutions that are referring you these patients. They know what their patients are like. They can understand and see what those characteristics are of that young, anxious uh, mom that's coming into the hospital and, and get them in for some pre-op education and, and start some of those uh, strategies early on. There's all these pre-op education classes for hips and knees and joints. There's no reason that can't be part of your ERAS protocols as well. Uh, and have pain be a focus because it really often isn't a focus for, for those high-risk populations. And clearly, you know, in terms of implementing those strategies, when you identify them pre-op, you also have to be ready to identify them acutely post-op because there's that patient who's using more than their 80 milligrams of oral morph morphine equivalents on a daily basis that's going to be a, a, a problem. And, and, you know, when we look at what those referrals from primary care can look like, we've come, we've put together, and I think Angie has shared these slides, some specific risk factors both before the specific surgical uh, um, uh, types of surgery, sorry, that patients are having that are rendering them higher risk and some of the things to look for in particular after surgery when they when they go back to see their uh, family care uh, physician. And so I touched on that 80 milligram of PO morphine in that initial 24 hours after surgery. I was pleasantly surprised when I was at the Canadian Pain Society meeting last year that that's the number that Dal uses. You know, if a patient comes in and they are consuming more than 80 milligrams, that, that highlights who they're going to run ketamine or, or lidocaine infusions on immediately postoperatively. In, in our case, any Anybody that's on the APS beyond uh, a reasonable time frame will actually uh, be uh, followed and there will be a, a consult done by a physician and our clinical psychologist and anybody who bounces back. So if you discharge them from your APS and they come back to you, something's up. Clearly, anybody going home on long-acting opioids, we see it over and over again. They walk out the hospital, we have no clue what's happening with those patients. 
and they would benefit from uh, long-term follow-up with respect to these patients. Um, what did we do here? So, uh, you know, in the last year, we put forth a couple of publications uh, talking about novel strategies, discussing the concept of, you know, helping with uh, dealing with prescribing of opioids and controlled substances. And we recently published that roadmap with respect to if you wanted to build a program similar to this, this is uh, where you would find it in the Journal of Pain Research uh, Open Access. So I'm happy to talk a little bit more about anything that, that I've said here and any questions you have maybe with respect to okay. what we're doing uh, at uh, our institution. Thanks, Angie. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Anne. So we have some time for questions, and I'll just uh, open it up for anybody to jump in. I've unmuted all of your lines, but uh, so if you feel the, the need to mute them again, you'll have to do that on your own. I'll just check the chat line as well to see if anyone's written in. Sounds good. Martin says, thank you, great talk. Thanks, Martin. Thanks for joining Thanks, us. Martin. We've got somebody here. Um, let's see, from Rebecca, are there resources on the mindfulness site that we can access? Um, so resources, I mean, if you, your patients can certainly have access to the, the the types of meditations that are on there, so they, they, they can access and use what's on there, absolutely. I'll also mention that anyone can just feel free to jump in. You don't have to type in your questions. Um, a question from Rob, though. Any evidence for starting gabapentin pre-op in a chronic pain patient who is not on gabapentin pre-op? If so, what's the dose and time to start? So fan fantastic question. I could probably talk for about 15 minutes on that. I would say that from an evidence-based standpoint, clearly we know that most of the trials that have been done perioperatively with gabapentin have not been done on a chronic pain patient. That being said, you know, if your patient is an inpatient, there is absolutely no reason to, to do not start gabapentin on these patients. And if they have good working kidneys, I would say you want to go with the higher doses preoperatively. You want to go with the that's where the evidence has been shown. Now, postoperatively, I would I would probably start at about 200 CID. That's where most of the studies have, have sat to this point. And you will see a significant opioid sparing effect because, uh, you know, there is a synergistic effect uh, of your gabapentinoids with your opioid receptor as well. Um, if you don't, then what are you left with? You're left with your opioids that are being ramped up without uh, any other adjuncts in the background. So I actually argue that there are some specific options that should absolutely be given gabapentin, and I would say your chronic pain patient on an opioid is an ideal candidate, in particular if they're not on a gabapentin. Problem is that's a small percentage of many of our patients because they all come in if they're if they have a chronic pain history as they should on a first line uh, uh, neuropathic such as gabapentin. So if you if you have one of those individuals who's not on it beforehand, absolutely start them on. Now, if you're in an outpatient setting and you want to send that patient home within your two hours, you may want to back down to the 600 milligram mark. Got a follow-up question here. After giving IV dex, what is the time to max effect? Any evidence for dose? So yeah, so there's a huge systematic review in uh, the BJA actually. I think it was in October 2013 or 2012, <laughs> October 2012, 13 or 14. Just pick up one of those editions, and they do an excellent dose response for dex and. Uh, the argument there is you don't need high doses, about 0.1 milligram per kilo works out, you know, in a 70 kilo uh, 
individual is 7 to 8 milligrams. And uh, there isn't a, uh, clearly DEX is the longest half-life of any steroids we can give perioperatively. And typically you see an effect in at about that 4 to 8 hour mark, and it even lasts to the 16 hour mark. There really isn't a difference uh, with respect to uh, anything above 0.1 milligrams per kilo. So that's the, that's the ball game you want to land in. Question from Tom. Ketamine, does a single intra-op dose reduce chronic pain or does it take an infusion to affect chronic pain? It's a good question. I don't think, I don't think we have enough data. What, what we do know is that, uh, uh, you know, as I said, from, from what I've been uh, reading and talking to some of the other folks who like these ketamine, it doesn't seem to matter with respect to the effect you're going to get in the acute post-op setting. So in terms of what that, what that end point is. I personally probably don't think it matters whether it's a infusion or a bolus dose, uh, as long as, uh, again, this is anecdotal. I don't have evidence to say, to answer that question appropriately from a, a, a chronic But hopefully, you know the circuit and some of that filler on data to get some answers to that stuff. Question from Rob. Um, any studies on chronic marijuana users as a risk factor for CPS? Oh, great question. Um, I, don't, I don't think we have the data. I, I think, you know, for the longest time, people were not disclosing their recreational cannabis use. And so are we, if we're talking synthetic cannabinoids, clearly that data doesn't exist. But the good thing is, based on the change of the, uh, you know, our political climate, is that people aren't afraid to discuss medical cannabis. And, you know, one of the, one of the papers we recently published was the ability to wean a patient from their opioids using medical cannabis, a, a post-transplant patient, actually, uh, with our service. So we don't shy away from it. If a patient comes in and they're on cannabis, and they're going to continue using cannabis, and they have a pain history, we may as well engage with them. Now, to answer your question in terms of, does so it put them at risk for developing pain? I don't know. Okay, I have another question here from Alan. Are surgeons made aware that anesthesia would appreciate being informed about at-risk patients coming for surgery in your hospital? Absolutely. So, you know, it's taken, we've had this program up and running now about a year and a half. And with any new service, any time you introduce something, it took some time to get buy-in. And, and you, know, you know, people buy in for their own uh, motives. And the, one of the things that the surgeons really like is that, you know, if you have a program like this and they can sense their, pro their patients that will be problematic, you now have an out for them, right? So there's a problematic patient. Instead of uh, bad medical practice, which is what's been happening when their secretaries are faxing opioid scripts to pharmacies because they're on the phone and they're too busy, guess what? You have a transitional pain service now that this problematic pain patient, and then we have the opportunity to say, what's going on here? Is this an opioid-naive patient that's now truly developing a pain problem? Is this opioid-seeking behavior, which we've seen many times, and we have uh, good, some good data to show, you know, our young males, if you have a man under 30 and you send them out with their oxycodones or their, or whatever opioid you give them, they're at high risk for continuing those, those opioid uh, prescribing and, and seeking habits uh, if, they, if they get hooked. So uh, absolutely, surgeons are now much more ready and willing. Our thoracic population, our thoracic surgery population, who, you know, have some of the, one of the biggest, highest profile programs in the world with their lung transplants and all these things, they really didn't understand what we were saying and talking about. But remember, many of the places that, you know, you work at in Vancouver and in Toronto, uh, or Victoria for that matter, were world-class institutions. And what I always say is, listen, this is a problem. The problem's not going anywhere. And we can either pretend it doesn't exist or we can accept it and be leaders in trying to deal with it and change and preparing patients appropriately. And that message eventually gets there. We've developed an entire pre-surgical program for our thoracic uh, surgeons who at first were probably one of the ones who didn't even believe that their patients had pain. Uh, 
Thanks, Hans. And I'll just mention one more time. If anybody wants to speak with Hans directly, feel free to just jump in on the line. Um, you don't have to write to your questions through the chat. Um, here's another question. Pharmacists at my hospital are reluctant to consider a lidocaine or ketamine infusion on the ward. Is this warranted? What minimum monitoring would you suggest? So I, I think that that issue is ubiquitous across all hospitals. And so there, there have been other hospitals that uh, here in the GTA that have been trying to get that, and they just give up because of the fight from the pharmacies. The fact is we have the luxury of having stepped down. So I don't think we would win in the regular ward setting, but on many of our wards, we do have step-down units. And so as opposed to the ICU care, which, you know, most hospitals, if you want to run a ketamine or a lidocaine infusion, you, you do have to end up in a, you know, a higher intensity setting. Uh, we've gotten away with creating these protocols in our um, step-down units. Unfortunately, there we still have SAT probes on the patients and, and uh, monitor, you know, their, their BPs routinely. But if you're running, you know, infusions, in particular of ketamine, less than 30 milligrams an hour, which some institutions cap it at that number, then you really are fraught with minimal uh, complications. So what I would suggest is if you want to do this in your hospital, contact, uh, you know, myself, uh, contact Dal, uh, some of the Alberta hospitals, they all run uh, ketamine and, and lidocaine infusions, some of them, I think, on their wards. And once you can show that there are other institutions doing this, that, you know, you might get better buy-in. Okay, here's another one. I run into a lot of patients who have chronic pain and are smokers. Hospitals have a no smoking policy. Do you see these patients who are not smoking at at more risk of post op pain control? Who are not smoking because they already uh, are smoking. Well, it, it, it's kind of a, a chicken before the egg kind of question because, you know, one of the things that we found a very strong association with in particular, uh, the people who went on to develop pain and were part of our transitional pain program and were analyzing a bunch of things is smoking. So smoking, as you would imagine, is a risk factor for so many things, but it's also a risk factor for pain. So I don't know if we're helping our patients by enabling them to smoke or, or, or not. It clearly would be an anxiolytic mechanism, so maybe there's some benefit there. But those are uh, uh, interesting hypotheses. All right, well, we're at 6.05 now. Is there, are there any lingering questions? Aha, what SNRIs have been studied? So there is uh, a, a deloxetine study that uh, I got wind of that should be published in the next couple of months perioperatively, and uh, there is supposedly a positive uh, um, effect of starting a few weeks before and continuing through the perioperative time period. It's a great question because you're right, there isn't a lot of data out there with respect to periop use, but there is data in the chronic neuropathic pain population, and so we are making some extra extrapolations. Uh, that being said, there is a paper about uh, to be published supposedly with a positive effect. So, insightful question. Okay, well, maybe this is a, a good place to wrap up. If there are any other lingering questions or anything that come up later on, please do feel free to email me um, at um, achan at doctorsofbc.ca, uh, and I'll just um, put my email up there, and then I can always um, pass those on to Hans, and maybe Hans, you might have a, an opportunity to answer them. Um, I really want to thank all of you for joining the webinar today, and I really have to thank Hans, um, especially as there's a time difference. Um, thank you for giving us some time during your evening um, to join us today. It's been a really insightful presentation, and I've got a lot of great feedback here on, um, on the chat line. So thank you so much, and we will be posting this on the website for pa from PainBC and ERS Collaborative um, within the week. My pleasure, Andy. Thanks, thanks to everybody who uh, spent the hour with us. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Have a great night, everyone. Bye. Thanks.